Okay, good. Um, yeah, thank you, Chairman, for the introduction. And uh, I want to thank the organizers for um, putting together this very nice workshop and for inviting me to give a talk here. Uh, yeah, in, in several of the previous talks, we learned that uh, tensor product states are, are very useful to uh, classify um, various phases of matter. And, uh, and in my talk, I mainly want to focus on a more uh, practical or more like uh, applied aspect. I want to show how we can use uh, tensor product states to derive uh, various order parameters that help us to um, detect uh, phases that emerge in the presence of certain symmetries. Uh, and in particular, I just have a kind of, uh, a kind of two topics that I want to cover. In the first part, I want to mainly talk about uh, symmetry protected topological order in one dimensional systems, where I want to begin by uh, reminding you of uh, the um, classification of these kind of phases. In fact, uh, there's a comple complete uh, classification of these phases. And then I want to show uh, how we can derive um, relatively um, kind of a simple order parameter that we can just uh, calculate or potentially measure um, to, de to detect these phases um, um, starting from uh, some, some, some Hamiltonian that we are looking at. Uh, and in the, um, in the second part, I want to talk about so-called symmetry-enriched um, topological order that we, are, I think, have not heard about so far. But the uh, main idea is that we um, start from a kind of a system that um, exhibits topological order, and then it turns out that um, kind of more complex structures can arise when we um, have symmetries. So, and then I'm going to um, show how, at least for a um, certain set of these um, orders, we can actually um, detect them um, quite nicely, um, starting from, from tensor product states. And also, we can derive some uh, non-local order parameters. However, I, I think I'm not going to um, be able to get into this. OK, um, let me now start talking about the, the first of these topics. Namely, um, I want to talk a little bit about uh, SBT phases uh, in one-dimensional systems. So, and I first want to uh, draw just like a schematic phase diagram where we have here some parameter one and maybe here I have a parameter two. And we now think about that we can tune this parameter in the model. And first, if in a one-dimensional system, we do not have any symmetry. So we have a system that uh, is completely unsymmetric, it's just some random terms. Um, we already know that there's only one phase. And we know this from a number of uh, recent works by uh, Norbert Schuch and also uh, um, Scheer. Uh, so, so there's only one phase. And I'm not explaining exactly what phases are because there's like a, this has been covered in a, in a number of different talks. So in particular, um, we, we just uh, um, can just move to everywhere without closing a gap. Good. So, so now let us just put symmetry into the system. So let's say that the Hamiltonian that we are looking at has a particular symmetry. So it could be just a Z2 symmetry or uh, SUN symmetry, some, some more complex symmetries. Uh, first of all, we can now have like certain phases um, that break symmetries. So this is like a, a, a symmetry broken, broken phase. I mean, this is a phase that we would, for example, have in a simple transverse field Ising model, where we can uh, now tune the transverse field, and we can have a transition between a trivial paramagnetic phase that has the Z2 symmetry, and we can actually tune into a ferromagnetic phase, say, um, where the Z2 symmetry is spontaneously broken. And then we know from Landau's theory of phase transition, it's not possible to go from here to here without undergoing a phase transition. And most importantly, like, like at least for this talk, um, it's easy to detect. I mean, to say that we want to do a numerical simulation of such a model, or maybe uh, measure a material that undergoes this transition, we know that we can just measure the magnetization. So the magnetization is the expectation value of the um, of, of sigma z, say. Um, and then we find it's zero here, and it's non-zero here. And that helps us to just uh, um, kind of figure out where, where, where we are in the phase diagram and what the system is doing. Uh, and then there's another class, and this is the class I want to talk about. These are the so-called uh, SPT, or like the symmetry protected <coughs> topological phases. So uh, in this SPT phase, we actually find that the ground state will have the same symmetry um, as the um, kind of trivial or the kind of uh, the paramagnetic phase here. Um, so 
that would render these kind of local order parameters useless. So if we just uh, measure all kind of local quantities like magnetization, etc., we wouldn't see any difference between these phases. We would see that the gap is closing, but we're not sure this we are running into a different phase or just accidentally having um, some closing of the gap. Good. And uh, this is what I want to focus on now, like uh, come up with some ideas. Um, how can we actually um, detect these phases? So say we have a Hamiltonian, and um, our task is to... Um, to map out the phase diagram and I'm going to show what kind of um, expectation values we can calculate or what kind of quantities we can calculate to, uh, um, to put a label on this phase. And in this, this is kind of very related to the very first talk um, we heard by um, Bruno this morning, uh, um, Monday morning it was. Um, good. And just to motivate it a little bit, I want to start by looking at a um, concrete uh, example. And this is sort of a um, the, the so-called Haldane phase, uh, which again has been mentioned various times during this, these four days, but I want to just reiterate it briefly. And the Haldane phase shows up in the uh, like S equals to 1 Heisenberg chain. Um, and uh, in particular, this is a gapped phase. And for future reference, like when I talk about phases and uh, phase diagrams and whatever, um, I will always assume that um, uh, we're having gapped phases. So I'm not touching any gapless phase here. We have a um, gapped phase and um, no, no symmetries are broken. So in the traditional picture, this would be just a, or maybe a um, simple power magnet because we don't have any um, broken symmetries. Um, however, um, this particular phase, or like um, states in this phase, have, uh, have some uh, um, interesting properties. So in particular, if we um, just diagonalize the Hamiltonian on a ring, so we just uh, assume periodic boundary conditions, we find a unique, um, you find a unique ground state on, oh, a, on a ring. Um, however, we find that the ground state is fourfold uh, degenerate um, on an open chain. Good. Uh, and again, this what I'm telling now has been mentioned before. Um, we can uh, understand this um, um, using a, a, a like a slightly different model, which is related to be adiabatically, which is adiabatically connected to this um, Heisenberg chain, and this is a so-called uh, AKLT model. So the physics or the nature of the ground state, like the physics, um, can be nicely understood um, using the um, so-called AKLT model. It's for F. Like Kennedy, Lieben, Tasaki, and. Uh, the, the model is just simply a, a sum over all sides, and we have just a, a pi, pi plus 1. And this is just a projector onto the spin 2 state on the bond. And we can also just easily write it in terms of the um, um, spin, spin operators. So this is just the um, Heisenberg model where we just add a, 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 cube, um, um, a, um, a biquadratic term. Now, now we can, um, and then the, the nature of this ground state is in the following, and again this has mentioned before, that um, each of the spin ones, um, we split up into two spin one halves. So we have like sides where we have, uh, this is like a spin one side here, and we split it up into two spin one halves. And in the ground state, um, we find that the, um, that the spin one halves, let me just use a different color maybe, so the spin one halves are now forming uh, singlets with the neighboring side. So whenever I draw now like um, this shape, this is just a singlet. So this is just one divided by square root of two times uh, up spin, down spin, minus down spin, up spin. Okay, so and uh, from this simple cartoon picture, we um, and understand that the ground state uh, is gapped. So whenever we want to uh, um, um, kind of um, if you just break, if you just break one of these singlets, we have to pay the energy that it costs to break one of these singlets. Uh, 
So that's the ring, and we find that there's a unique ground state. So we didn't really have to think how we arrange these singlets. So there's a unique way of doing it. Uh, but now let us look at the open chain. So we just take this ring and we just break it open. Uh, and by this, of course, we have to break a singlet. And uh, then we get the following picture, uh, where we have now here again our spin one half degrees of freedom. And these are now forming singlets. So here we see that um, at the, I didn't draw it very clearly, but the story is bigger. Um, so here we have uh, some, um, kind of some um, half integer spin degrees of freedom sitting at the edge of our, our chain. And, uh, and this is now exactly the, um, giving us the, uh, let me just write it down, so we have now the S equals to one half edge spins, uh, edge spins. And these are causing now a fourfold uh, degeneracy. Good. And, uh, and that's already some, I think, very remarkable feature because we're having now a, a model where the elementary degrees of freedom or like the, um, the um, the building blocks that we have are, are um, integer spin. So we have spin one things that we're building our um, model out of. However, we're having now a kind of a fractionalized spins sitting at the edges. So here there's spin one halves. And in fact, um, this might look like a mathematical um, game to play. However, um, these edge spins also have been observed experimentally. So there are certain materials that can, uh, they're in a good approximation described by integer spin chains. And if one dopes these systems with non-magnetic impurities, so which corresponds to basically just breaking up these chains, one can observe these um, spin one halves in these systems. So this is uh, actually real. <laughs> good. And, uh, and, and this is now actually one example of a, of a pretty big class, namely of the class of these uh, symmetry protected um, um, topological phases. And uh, after kind of just introducing this, this example, I want to uh, um, formalize this now a little bit. Um, so, so if we have now an SPT phase, um, we assume now that um, we have a certain symmetry, which can be uh, whatever um, kind of symmetry we, we like to think about, and uh, the Hamiltonian, and um, also the, the ground state have uh, the same symmetry uh, uh, group. And uh, what we're going to find, and I'm going to uh, elaborate on this a little bit, is that these um, uh, SPT phases are then uh, characterized um, by kind of symmetry fractionalization. I'm going to tell what this is. And in particular, we assume that we have a linear representation of a symmetry in the bulk. And we have a kind of a projective representation uh, representation at the edge. So what I mean by this, like uh, um, we have now, if we just uh, take this example again, and we um, use a symmetry, and then uh, for this model we could use uh, um, kind of um, kind of um, element groups like which are part in the SU2 symmetry of the system, or like any subgroup of this as uh, Z2 cross Z2, etc. So we just act now uh, like have a product of 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 some element of our symmetry group, and we act on this on the on the on the entire segment. And uh, um, then we find that um, the edge degrees of freedom transform under some uh, projective representations, right? So, so these u here are now the projective representation. And in this case, it's uh, easy to see we have uh, in the bulk, as I said, we have um, integer spins. So we have spin ones. So these are linear representations of maybe the spin rotations. And here we have a half integer spin, re um, half integer representation of the rotation group at the boundary. Good. So this is maybe the characterizing feature 
of um, SPT phases here. Good. Uh, good. I kind of mentioned now many times this word projective representations. Um, let me just uh, briefly remind you what, what, what I mean by this. So if you have a projective representation, representation. Um, and the projective representation is basically like a, a linear representation of a group modular, uh, modular a phase. So let us assume that we have G, H, and K are um, elements of a group G. And uh, we have now certain multiplication rules for our elements. So if you just multiply G times H is equals to K, uh, then we find that if we just multiply the um, representations, UG times UH is equals to E to the I. And now we have just a, we get a phase factor times uh, UK. If this one is identity, we have just a linear representation. If we have now these, uh, um, this phase factor, this is a projective representation. Uh, and then, and I think this is a question that um, Isaac Schur asked himself like more than 100 years ago. The question is like, if I just write down some uh, kind of, if I choose particular phase factors here, um, can I actually now just um, kind of continuously change the phases to actually um, lift this projective representation to a linear representation, right? I mean, um, and uh, he found that you, you, you can't, um, depending on uh, um, and a certain scheme that we can use to classify these different projective representations, we can only uh, transform particular phases that are in the same class into each other. So, and um, in the modern language, I mean, I think back then, he, this is where you see um, the sure multipliers, and uh, now this is uh, like in equivalent, in equivalent um, projective representations um, are classified um, by um, the second cohomology, so H2 of G over U1. Good. So, so we have to calculate this one, and from this we can actually now tell um, whether um, the, the, the representation is a projective one or something that can be just uh, lifted to a trivial one. The phase is the same for each and every element? Say this again, please. The phases are different for different elements or the same for each and every element? Oh, they can be different. I mean, I can give you an example, actually, now, um, um, or two examples. Um, let's, um, because now we can actually already kind of, um, from, from this approach, we will to be able to do the following. Because if someone gives us a Hamiltonian, we can just look at the symmetries of that Hamiltonian, and then we will be able to answer if there is a chance to have an SBT phase or not. And uh, for this, let us start. We, someone hands us a Hamiltonian, which has just a simple um, ZN symmetry, like, for example, a Z2 symmetry that we have in the, um, in the Ising model. Uh, then it turns out that there's actually um, 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 there's no uh, non-trivial non -trivial phase. Um, and we can see this sort of easily. We just know we have uh, in, in, in this group, we have as a generator just um, R. R is now just the rotation of, um, by, by 2 pi over n. Uh, and if we just uh, write down, we can just write, okay, we know that if uh, R to the power of n is equal to the identity, uh, then we get here, because there's only one element, we get only one, one, one possible choice that we could have the phase, namely that u r to the power of n is equal to e to the i um, one phase times the identity. Uh, um, however, here we can just easily um, see that no matter whatever um, phase we choose here, we can just get rid of it. We can just uh, define another u tilde, which is just e to the i or e to the minus i phi divided by n, and we just uh, made it uh, to a linear representation. So, so here we don't have any chance to find uh, any um, SPT phase in a one-dimensional system. If, however, we use a slightly more complicated one, like Z2 cross Z2, um, we find that there's actually um, two, two inequivalent um, representations. And uh, the way we can do this, like in uh, uh, the Z2 cross Z2, this corresponds actually to uh, the rotation of some object about two orthogonal axes. So this is the uh, symmetry of a, of a, of a featureless book. Uh, and 
the, um, so we have like a rotation about x squared uh, and about u z squared is equals to 1. So with this, we can now actually fix the, the phase factors um, of u x and u z. Uh, however, we have like one other because the rotation about the x axis and the z axis, um, this commutes. So it doesn't matter which one I would do first. Um, so we have uh, u x times u z is equal to um, plus or minus u uh, z to u x. So um, here we actually see we have two inequivalent uh, um, projective representation, and uh, this cannot be uh, undone. So if you have like either um, um, u x times u z is either uh, u x and u z are either commuting or anti-commuting. So this is now the way that we can distinguish um, these two phases. So what have we achieved so far for this? We actually now can tell, uh, based on uh, previous works that, uh, from, from, that are now done by many mathematicians, um, what kind of symmetry can give us like how many different uh, um, projective representations. And also, we basically now know what kind of labels we can put. So we could say that we just go here, and then we say, well, here we have maybe a plus phase, or like we could call it like a uh, phi equals to zero phase, and this is our phi equals to pi phase. So now we can just put labels on the different uh, SPT phases. Uh, but now we want to come to what I promised, that we just uh, want to do something more applied. So the question is, uh, if we have now some Hamiltonian, how can we actually extract this information? Um, so how to detect um, SPT order. Good. And in particular, I want to show you um, how we can just write down some sort of a non-local order parameter that is doing this for us. Uh, and and here I'm gonna um, gonna see um, being like a little bit close to what we heard in the first lecture by by Bruno. And in particular, I want to uh, advertise a very similar idea, namely that. So. So, so here we see that um, we were um, in order, like the, the kind of uh, characterizing feature of these SPT phases were the edge spins. Uh, and a nice way is actually do the following now. We just uh, take a system that is infinitely long, so we actually don't have any edges, but now we actually uh, create some sort of artificial edges using a Schmidt decomposition. Um, gives kind of axis. to so-called uh, artificial edges. Um, and the reason we're following, we have now our um, like infinite chain. And we just uh, um, do a, perform a bipartition of our chain into a left part and a right part. Good. And now we can just write down our wave function for this system as being a sum of alpha equals to 1 to infinity of uh, some Schmidt values, lambda alpha times uh, phi alpha left, alpha right. No. And uh, yeah, these Schmidt states are like uh, orthogonal. Um, good. So so we write down a Schmidt decomposition of a state, and uh, in principle, like now we are just doing a Schmidt decomposition of a state that is uh, infinitely long to the left and to the right. However, um, and uh, this has been I think discussed also in many talks before that for um, for for, for the ground states of uh, one-dimensional uh, Hamiltonians, one, for, for one-dimensional and gapped Hamiltonians, we know that instead of summing here from 1 to infinity, we actually capture most of the information in the wave function by only summing from here to, uh, I don't know, just to a small number chi. Right? So we just, uh, most or like almost the entire information that's contained in the wave function is in a few of these Schmidt states. The few largest one, right? I, 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 for this, I assume that I um, sort them according to the size. I just uh, assume that um, they are just sorted this way. Can you 
Oh, we got the bear run. <laughs> okay. Late for everyone here. <laughs> okay. Um, and then I can just uh, cut them off, and, uh, and that's quite remarkable. Um, and this is uh, the, the uh, reason why um, MPS are, are working so well in, in one dimensional <coughs> systems. So, so, what we find, like for one dimensional systems, um, on Say it again, please. So it's not the only man in scare, or it's always? Well, this is. Well, I, I mean, understand that it's always, but it's that you can sum up on it with a small constant. Well, for, for an infinite system, this is, is definitely true for, for gapped systems. And if you have uh, um, a gapless system, like an, it's infinite, then we don't get away with it. I mean, like if, if we have a critical state, we actually have. To, to sum over infinitely many states to get a, a very good approximation of the state. I mean, just, I think, at least the picture, I don't, the cartoon picture I have, and I'm not 100% sure it's true, is that if I have a critical state, uh, so, so, so if, I, if I plot now here the, I sort my lambda alpha, and, and I, I sort them according to their size, for a critical system, I will find something like this. So then I can happily just truncate it here without losing uh, information. For a governor's uh, hmm? system. For a gapped system, uh, and for a uh, for gapped, so this is uh, gapped. Um, but for a for a gapless system, um, yeah, I think they are basically. Um, I would assume that they are flat and uh, basically zero everywhere. So no matter where I cut, I will always cut away most of the stuff from the wave function. <coughs> I'm not sure. There's. I mean, I, I took this basically from a work by. Uh, Calabrese and Lefebvre, where they write down some distribution function of these, and uh, that distribution function, as a function of the correlation links, actually goes flat if we kind of if the correlation links um, goes to infinity. I mean, this is at least a cartoon picture I, I have of uh, what what happens. Good, but this we are not thinking about this. We are thinking about gap states. Good. Uh, yeah. So, so only um, only say chi states, uh, chi, and this is like we assume like much smaller than infinity for practical purposes. Um, um, states um, contribute um, so yourself significantly. Uh, and this gives, as I said, uh, rise to the fact that we can uh, like nicely approximate these um, the, the ground states of uh, of, 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 um, of local and gap Hamiltonians efficiently using uh, matrix product states. So so we just now try to use uh, matrix product states. And in particular, I want to use the uh, so-called canonical form. And I'm using the, the notation that I actually learned from uh, Giffre's, um paper. Uh, um, and in fact, we just uh, write down the um, amplitudes now of the um, wave function. Uh, I don't write like n and so on. So it's like an infinite state. So basically, we have infinitely many indices here. And uh, we express this one as uh, in the following form. And it's Good to be here, so I can just uh, write this kind of form because it showed up many times before, like using these diagrams that are very useful. Uh, and uh, here we have now the following uh, form, which I've been, we have seen many times before. Like here we have the um, kind of the, the, the physical degrees of freedom of the matrix product states, and here we have the um, kind of the virtual um, um, degrees of freedom, and uh, this goes like on to to infinity. And uh, the the the, um, the this form that I've chosen here is the following. Like here, these um, um, lambda, these are just diagonal um, matrices that have the kind of uh, the Schmidt values on the diagonal, the Schmidt matrices, and uh, the matrices or the uh, the rank three tensors gamma here. They relate the local basis and the Schmidt basis um, to each other. Um, and uh, I like this form very much because of uh, the following. Because um, like if we have obtained our state in this form, so if we just use a numerical algorithm that spits out this uh, particular form of our matrix product state, it's uh, really easy for us to um, to get the Schmidt states, right? because the Schmidt states are 
like or the amplitudes of the Schmidt states, um, like I1 to IN. Let's say that here we do the Schmidt decomposition between side uh, I0 and I1. Um, is just simply given by so. So we just uh, have our matrix product state, and we just uh, we can just uh, erase like one half of it, and we just have here like some open index alpha, and then if we just multiply the rest, we automatically get our Schmidt state. So we just multiply our matrices, and then we have directly access to um, all the Schmidt states, and that would be very useful. And because of this orthogonality relation that we have here for the Schmidt states, we actually find the um, um, following nice identity. I don't know if it's uh, visible from somewhere, but if we just uh, multiply something like this times the identity, this is just the identity. And we can see this here because I argue here that the Schmidt states are orthogonal. If I now just multiply this with the, uh, with the cat, that is, um, uh, um, and using this orthogonality uh, relation, I, I find this identity here. And the same is also true for, for the left. So that we will um, use this actually later on. Good. Uh, let me now come to The, uh, how, how to extract the, um, the information about what kind of phase we are in. So, and here I just uh, use now some results that uh, were derived earlier by uh, um, Perez Garcia. So let us now assume that we have a state um, um, psi that is symmetric under um, like a product of GI, right? Um, so this is now just I have like some local, like um, some, some, for example, G could the spin rotation, like a rotating a spin about the x-axis, and we apply this to every side. Um, and then we know that the um, wave function is invariant under this, so it just changes only by a, by a phase. And then we know that if we now take our matrix gamma uh, and we just apply now the G to it, then the transformation is given by u g times gamma times u g dagger. Okay. Uh, and the matrices u g and lambda they come. Um, good. And uh, these are now exactly the um, projective representation I was talking about earlier. So because. Um, in, in, in other words, like kind of using this analogy here, we actually find that um, the matrix is U. So, so, so these, these indices here are exactly the indices uh, um, kind of enumerating the, the Schmidt states. So this is exactly the representation of our symmetry in terms of the edge mode, so in terms of the, um, um, the, the Schmidt states. So these uh, um, UG are the... Uh, projective representations we are after. <coughs> symmetry. And uh, what I've shown here now in, uh, in some more detail for kind of symmetry that are just products of on-site symmetries, we can actually um, derive the same results, like uh, similar um, <coughs> for um, inversion, like for inversion symmetry, um, we just go from I don't know, just, um, transpose the matrices. So then we just uh, just go from I just exchange left and right. So just like mirroring the um, the chain, and also for uh, time reversal symmetry. Excuse yeah. That's according to what I get up to against us. Which one? To the transpose. This one, but yeah. is you might actually have to do an extra gauge on this one. Uh, on the physical index. Yeah. Well, we could. I mean, like we can have no, like all kinds sure. of combination. Right. No, wait, wait. I mean, this is not equal. I mean, what we find. I mean, maybe. This is what I'm saying. We can use the same thing. So, which meaning like that uh, gamma transpose is equal to u 
I don't know, inversion times gamma times. And this is what I'm saying. So, so we can, like, if we just do inversion, like this would correspond to inversion. And uh, then we can just do a similar argument here, but we, instead of applying a group element here, we just invert it and express it using this kind of gauge transformation. <coughs> huh? we, okay. Oh, and also we have like I have some some phase factors here. Should it be U inversion inverse on the right? Hmm? Should it be an inverse on the right in principle? Say it again, please. Should it be an inverse in principle? I mean, you don't really know it's unitary in the case of inversion. Here, um, if I if I require that my state is like also in the uh, in the canonical form, I think it's a transpose. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a conjugate here. But maybe not for transposition present. Oh, for transposition? Okay, so then I put a question mark here. I, I'm, I, I wouldn't. <laughs> yeah, there's no I proof that this is unit here. Hmm? That does not fall from the results of the No, no, there's an, an, another. We did a, back then a calculation that uh, showed that this worked similar, but maybe we overlooked something. I wouldn't uh, bet on this by now. At least for all practical calculations that I did, it, it, it worked this way. And for time reversal symmetry, um, we find that uh, um, gamma <coughs> j is, is um, like the, the time reversal says uh, that we have e to the minus i pi times s y r uh, uh, i. Times a, a complex conjugate. So, so here we just uh, do a rotation by uh, 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 around the um, y-axis, and we take the complex conjugate of the um, of the matrix. Good. And uh, what I want to show now is that we can get these um, matrices uh, U here or the representation um, directly by um, diagonalizing the kind of a kind of a generalized or mixed transfer matrix. So the um, U G uh, can be uh, directly obtained um, by finding the dominant. Eigenvector uh, of the uh, generalized um, kind of transfer matrix. Um, in particular, well, can we T T G, and uh, let me just show 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 how, how how I can derive this. So we take now our um, matrix product state. And we just multiply only part of it. So, so this again is now a, a matrix product state representation of our Schmidt state. And uh, here we have now our gamma lambda, gamma lambda, gamma lambda, gamma lambda. And we apply now a symmetry operation to it, like G. And um, now we can use this identity here, and uh, we find we can now express. Uh, we just basically plug this one in, and we find that uh, everything just uh, oopsie, cancels, except at the last bond, like here. So we have already uh, kind of isolated this guy here, and now we can just um, multiply the, the cat. Um, and we can do this on both sides. Um, but now we can also um, use the um, identity that I have shown before. So then this is just uh, UG times uh, the, the identity. Right. And what we see here, um, this one just corresponds to multiplying uh, this, um, this object and again and again. So if you're just multiplying this matrix again and again, all that's going to be left eventually is the um, dominant eigenvector. And uh, this object here is the um, kind of a generalized transfer matrix, like Tg of alpha, alpha prime, and beta 
beta prime. Okay, so and uh, again, <clears throat> and if we have now uh, um, uh, done this. Uh, So, 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 so basically, um, like just coming back to um, the kind of practical application. So, if we have now used uh, uh, some algorithm that uh, maybe um, DMRG, and we have now uh, obtained our matrix product state, um, we just need to construct this matrix by sandwiching our symmetry operation into um, this object and construct a, a matrix just by reshaping this object. We just diagonalize the matrix, find the dominant eigenvector of this matrix, and the corresponding eigenvector is immediately our our um, our um, kind of projective representation of a symmetry. So this is um, comes basically for free. So if you have done DMRG, that information is is, is all there. And once you have now um, obtained your um, the the representation of a symmetry, you can then basically just read off what kind of phase you are in. You can just re read off the label. So, for example, for Z2 cross Z2, you just want to calculate the, um, the commutator, Ux, Uz, times U, uh, Ux uh, minus 1 times uh, Uz minus 1. And uh, this one is then actually plus or minus uh, chi. Good. Uh, depending on which phase you're in, and chi again being the dimension of your of your matrix or the number of states that you keep in your DMRG code, and for inversion, um, we just find that the trace of u times u star. So this is slightly different, but in a similar reason, we just find that because for if we have a system that is inversion symmetric, we can just distinguish the two phases depending on whether u is a symmetric or anti symmetric matrix. So this is plus or minus one, and the same for time reversal. So then we have like again, same thing. Good. So so from this we can now actually just directly um, uh, read off what kind of phase we are in. And uh, one yeah. Like C two times C two, and not an infinite group. Um, here we, be, I mean, we just take the um, the two. Uh, we have, I mean, the, the model that back then we, we applied it to was a model that actually had this particular symmetry, and then we uh, calculated for this. And yeah, no. My question is that why do you get the finite? We we started. Like, you mean like where, where we start here with the finite group, or why we get so on U G is for my group, right? Yeah, I mean, like, you, you this can be anything. I mean, you can just, that depends on the physical system you're looking at. I mean, you can also have a, an infinite, you can have maybe SU2 or. But then the size of this group is the number of symmetries, right? Uh, I mean, the cardinality of this group is the number of symmetries. Yeah, I mean, if it's, so say you want to do like a complete, like if you have like a, a model with many symmetries, then you will have like to look at many symmetries to. To figure out for whether for a particular symmetry you're having uh, different, I mean, the, there's, there's various phases you can look for. Yeah, but if, you, if the group is infinite, does it mean you have infinitely many phases? Um, actually, I'm. Or, or maybe I am just on a completely wrong track. So maybe I am on the wrong track. Well, I don't I mean, that's in short, I mean, like, we have particular symmetries, and if you have combination of symmetries, you can get, like, Ex extremely many different um, phases, yes. But uh, for for just asking, what if you start with a continuous group? Uh, as long as it's compact, the, the cohomology group is fine. Yeah, I mean, this is like you can just look at the group tables and see how many projective representations are like what the um, cohomology uh, classes you have. <coughs> so three, for instance, is finite, right? There are only two, so mm -hmm. two different classes, right? So. So there are cases where you have infinite symmetry, but or continuous symmetry, but you only have finite many cases. Frank, how, how robust is this in practice? I mean, if you try to do this near a critical point, 
does it get, do you get such a clean signal? Um, oh yeah, maybe you can just give some, I mean, I think it's pretty robust. I mean, that gives you some numbers. Like if I, for example, look at the, uh, um, um, this, this spin one model in, in a bike, in a, um, with a single ion, ion isotropy, I can go extremely near the uh, critical point where I already kind of see kind of finite chi effects and it still, still works. But there is actually also some sort of warning. Like if one has a system with an extremely long correlation length, and uh, um, also if, 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 if you kind of, for example, um, are not able to tell from your exact diagonalization or from your DMRG simulation if the system is gapless or gapped, and you just nevertheless um, just calculate one of these order parameters, and you neglect the fact that the uh, dominant eigenvector is not one, but it's maybe 0.99, uh, you just might be on the wrong track. I mean, this is a good thing. I mean, like, one, like when you just diagonalize the transfer matrix, you really want to make sure that the dominant eigenvector is, is exactly one, like up to machine precision. And, uh, and then you can um, trust the results. If, if you find something slightly smaller than one, it's, it's dangerous because you might actually be in a, in a gapless phase. And you don't need to import the symmetry at the level of the MPS? No, no, that comes out. I mean, the symmetries come out. So, Frank, but maybe the previous question was you, you haven't really explained why you only need to look at the second cohomology and not. So, you can compute UG, but then you only look, which is projective representation, and mm -hmm. then you figure out in which class to, to which class it, you can figure out to which class it belongs. Right, yeah. But you haven't really explained why, why that is the only thing you would want to look at. Oh, that's right. I mean, um, what, what I want to show here is right now that we can actually put labels and then we know these two phases will not be adiabatically connected. Like I can just say, I look at, um, um, I don't know, I just pick randomly like some symmetry that I find in my system, calculate um, the cohomology classes, and then I can tell, okay, these phases cannot be connected. Like I have a pi phase and a zero phase, there's no way that I can go adiabatically from one to the other one. Um, the fact that if I find now two phases, and I, I say I just exhausted all symmetries in my system, and I um, calculated then all the homology classes for those, and I find the same labels for state number one and state number two. Actually, there's a theorem by Nova Schuch and also by uh, Chen Chia, who showed that um, then there's actually an adiabatic path between these two. If one can show this using matrix product states that you can just construct a path connecting these two ways. Does this answer the question? So it's yes, but we are always the that we have to get the homology. I mean, it's a non-trivial state, but yeah. I actually feel. So, yeah, so I think, so, yeah, that's, that's, I guess, yeah, thank you. Good. Well, there, oh, I think time is uh, passing very quickly. Um, let me now just very briefly at least uh, kind of pose the problem for the second part um, in terms of the uh, uh, kind of symmetry uh, enriched. Uh, topological order. Um, here, let me just start like in a similar way as I did uh, for the SBT phases. It's correct that there's about five minutes left, no? Or ten minutes? Okay, that's good. So I have a little bit more time. Good. I always have it late. Okay. Um, again, I can now draw like a phase diagram as uh, as before, where I just have now um, some some parameters and. Um, let me just again first start by having no symmetry in the system. If there's no symmetry, um, we actually find um, um, still a distinction between phases which are trivial, um, and we have kind of topologically um, ordered phases. So for, for, for making this distinction, we don't need any symmetries. And uh, this has been uh, shown in, in several talks. Um, but now, uh, um, and then this is kind of even without symmetries, as, uh, as I would claim, it's so rich that we are don't we don't really understand it. I mean, at this moment we can't really we know that there are for sure trivial phases, topologically ordered phases, and chiral phases, but maybe there's uh, much more. I don't think that there's any claim of uh, completeness at this level, at least not that I know of. Um, and now um, we add symmetry to the system, um, and then again we can have a distinction between trivial phases and uh, kind of. Uh, symmetry in broken phases. Um, then also in, in two dimensions, we can have uh, symmetry protected phases, such as uh, topological insulators, uh, etc. But 
one thing, and this is what I want to focus on, is we can actually um, um, have a, like a richer structure on these topologically ordered faces. So say that, uh, um, just to pick up on some example that we've seen before, we could have the, um, the Toric code, like the Z2 um, topological order, and uh, we find that if we kind of enforce certain symmetries, that the topologically ordered phases actually, um, uh, like this, in this case, maybe the kind of Toric code order actually splits up into Toric code, code a, order A and Toric code order B. And uh, only as long as the symmetries, certain symmetries are present, um, the phases are not connected. If I just get rid of the symmetries, um, I can get to go adiabatically from here to here. Okay. So let us now uh, assume that we have uh, some topologically ordered um, state. Um, with uh, some some symmetry, and I again assume that the um, the symmetry of the state is now the same as the symmetry of the Hamiltonian. Um, and let me now just simply draw some some pictures um, to illustrate my what I what I was um, thinking about here. So so this is now not a phase space, but this is now our our system. And uh, in terms of you know, this, like the kind of topological order, I just want to think of uh, some sort of a, a soup of uh, loops. And these um, loops are made out of um, something that I don't necessarily need to to specify here. However, that I um, want to um, show here now is that the, um, um, the system is um, kind of symmetric um, under um, some kind of, uh, kind of some symmetry uh, G that we apply to the entire system. And, uh, and oh, before I can kind of move on, I want to say like what I'm talking about now, it wouldn't be, um, here no, it will not be complete. I will only be able to detect um, particular or like a certain class of uh, symmetry and rich topological phases, not all of them. But for this particular class that I want to look at, I assume now that we have a system that's built out of a kind of elementary um, building blocks. We assume that um, the uh, objects transform, um, which are symmetric under a particular symmetry group, and they form according to a linear representation. Okay. Um, Good. So this is now the, the vacuum. The vacuum can just think of a, a soup of these um, these loops. So for the Tory code model, for example, we just think of terms of the um, loops formed by upspins. But now we can ha um, have um, excitations. So we have like anionic excitations in the system. Um, and the thing is now that the, now the anionic excitations they transform now uh, according to some uh, fractionalized. Um, a fractionalized uh, um, symmetry. And the particular class that I um, want to look at um, would be the one where the um, kind of different representation can again be uh, classified by H, uh, G of U1. Uh, Good. And uh, the uh, I'm running really short in time. So in order to, to shortcut a little bit, I um, that's going to say in uh, a few words the, the general idea that I want to follow and then just draw, like just write down a very simple toy model um, where we actually can just, by looking at the model, we actually already can tell what kind of phase we would be in with respect to this kind of classification. So the idea will be the following. And again, I can just refer to uh, quite some work that has been uh, um, shown during the past few days to how to detect them. Like uh, these um, SET, these kind of referring to those that um, we can actually distinguish here. Um, and the idea is now the following. Uh, first of all, we heard about the, um, um, that there's this topological degeneracy topological uh, degeneracy, um, which means that um, this was mentioned I think, by, by Shogun Wen and also by others, that um, if we just take a system with topological order and we put it on a torus, 
that we find that the ground state is degenerate. And the ground state degeneracy is actually um, equal to the number of um, quasar particles that we have in a system. So topological degeneracy on a torus, on a torus uh, corresponds to the number of different kind of anionic quasar particles we have. Okay, so now we actually have a system, so if we just diagonalize our Hamiltonian, we find uh, degenerate ground states. In particular, we have now like a degree of freedom how we choose these, um, these states. And uh, there's a particular choice to do this, and these are called, um, use the minimally entangled states. Um, and to get these, we just take our, um, our torus, and we now form a bipartition of the torus into, uh, in a sort of non-trivial way. We just cut our torus like this into A and into B. So this is like a non-trivial bipartition of a system. And it turns out, and this was shown by uh, Frank Cheng and uh, Ashwin Vishwanath and others, and before that I think also by uh, um, some other people, that, uh, um, that if, we, if we kind of do this partition, the entanglement entropy between, or the entanglement between the left and the right part depends actually on what kind of state we choose. So, so there's actually preferred basis that we maybe want to look at, and this is the one where we just minimize the entanglement. And if we choose um, these kind of states, then the um, ground states that we find, like the minimally entangled states, they are also eigenstates of um, Wilson loop operators um, that wind around the torus. So, so these are now um, eigenstates of the Wilson loop operator. Uh, these are also eigenstates of uh, Wilson loop operators. Loop operators um, being like parallel to the cut. And this means that the, um, these kind of, and if we just choose this particular basis, we have some sort of a well-defined kind of anionic um, flux going around the, um, um, this torus. And um, if we now take this, um, this torus and we just um, do like our Schmidt decomposition, say, of this torus, like this, we would find that um, these states actually have uh, a particular um, quasar particle type sitting here at the edge. So here we have now uh, a quasar particle, say, of type A. And this gives us now access to these quasar particles. And uh, the idea that I were to propose, but I think we are running out of time, is to do the following. We just, uh, instead of looking at a torus, we look at a, uh, like an infinite <laughs> cylinder, like which is very long, um, that we can map to, uh, um, that we can then map to, uh, um, to back to, to a matrix product state and do the Schmidt decomposition of a similar way. And then we can have this cartoon picture where we have now an anion of a particular type sitting here. Right, so now we have like an anion here of type, uh, type A. And this will, again, like in a similar way as before, give us access um, to the projective representation. So we just do the following. We just construct now sort of a generalized transfer matrix for, uh, for, our, kind of, uh, for our long cylinder. And then we can just uh, read off the, um, um, the projective representations again. So, and then this kind of tells us what kind of uh, SET phase we would be in. Okay, yeah, with this, I um, thank you. Okay, yeah, thanks for asking. Uh, <laughs> uh, the, a simple example is the following. We can, uh, let me just remove this. Like there. The example, at least, well, the simplest example might be just a fraction quantum Hall state where you just have fractional charges. Um, um, but the model that um, would fall to this um, category where we can use uh, um, the second cohomology to distinguish them would be for example, a model where you just have a honeycomb model, a honeycomb lattice. Um, and this model is constructed in such a way that we have just the spin one bosons sitting on this lattice. Maybe, for example, some here is like S equals to one bosons. And we say that, well, whenever we have bosons, um, these bosons um, like to form an AKLT chain. <laughs> right? 
So, so that, and that state is this is a state that we can just um, represent with uh, three-dimensional paths. So, whenever we have bosons, they form a KLT chain. And now we see that if we um, actually create, uh, oh, and then the ground state is going to be the equal weighted superposition of all those. So, if you look from the distance, it looks exactly like a Z2 um, liquid. If, however, we just break open some of this chain, um, we see here that we have um, just half integer um, um, spins um, um, associated with the electric charges in the in this um, Z2 model. And in fact, um, then in this way, it's like very similar in spirit to the um, kind of um, RVB state on a cargo lattice, because there the spin on excitations corresponding to those also carry fractional um, spins. Questions? Let's take this again. Thank you.